Do you want to uh, explain what these, what, why we're wearing these hats? Yeah, so the hats are conceptually incredibly simple. <laughs> There's actually a myth that our head of product likes to perpetuate yeah, that was coined almost 100 years ago that, yeah, that, 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 that says that humans only use 10% of their brains. It's actually not true. Uh, but one thing we've noticed in our 10 years at Simon Data is that so many enterprise brands, direct-to-consumer brands for us and you know, our customers today, they're not even using 10% of their data. They're probably using closer to 1% of their data. And at the same time, when we look at the opportunity to leverage a broad set of enterprise data, whether it be for a brand like Zillow and really getting down into the details of homes and, and buying and selling agents and mortgage products or whether it be uh, you know, brands in the travel industry and really understanding where are people uh, you know, vacationing, what are they trying to do, what are some of the availabilities and, and times for flights and beyond. There really is a wealth of information that's not tapped into. So when we think about 100X, it's really asking how do you use that next generation of data to drive the next generation of applications. We've seen pretty innovative things across our customer base over the years. When I look at the ability for AI to unlock that, it really is a next generation of opportunity. So this journey for you, as like a multi-decade journey, starting with you getting a PhD in machine learning, which was like a time before that was a buzzword and a cool thing. So can you explain a little bit about what led you to pursue that and what was interesting to you about that? Yeah, I always joke it took me about five years into my PhD to realize that the value, yeah, the value in data isn't some fancy algorithm. It's really how it's used in end applications. And using that as a guide, I started a business out of grad school with a couple of co-founders and, and, and my co-founder for Simon Data, Matt Walker, today as well. And fast forward to a decade ago from today, when we started Simon Data, we, we really saw a huge opportunity in cloud data. Um, yeah, with that, we saw a new way and a new form of access for brands of any scale to aggregate data from across the enterprise, to really understand customer behavior, not just across who's clicking on what on the web, but looking at customer support data, looking at sales data, looking you know, very deeply across inventory, customer reviews, and really anything else that might exist anywhere. But now we're in a place where it's a complete phase shift. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I feel like there was a point about a year and a half ago when OpenAI released the first version of ChatGPT to the public. And for the first time, it was like you could interact with AI in a way that meaningfully changed your your daily life, right? Like it wasn't like you were watching an AI win a game of chess or do something esoteric. Like you could actually ask it questions and get better answers than you could on Google. What has been the culmination leading to this boiling point that happened in the past year and a half? Yeah, I'll tell a funny story around this. Yeah, there are folks, there are scientists in the market today who have just believed very deeply that this is going to happen for a long time. One of those people was a NYU professor who's now Facebook's Meta's chief scientist. His name is Jan LeCun. I actually you know, was fortunate enough to win, win a best paper award when I was in grad school. What was people, your paper? Yeah, it was, it was a method around learning better ways for web search and information retrieval subject to constraints on the information. So as an example, if you're trying to understand sports across baseball, football, or, or basketball versus if you're trying to understand what's the level of play is at high school basketball or professional, you, how do you actually analyze? the data in a way that reflects what you actually care about. Or would what, it be able to make sense uh, of the Luca trade for us? Or? I, it would not make sense of the Luca trade for us at all, unfortunately. <laughs> I was presenting this thing, and after I gave the talk, I was well received, and Jan LeCun comes up, 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 up to me afterwards. He's like, you know, you seem like a smart enough guy. He's like, the stuff you're working on is not powerful enough to really move the needle. He's, it's, it feels like, you know, you're just going from N to N plus one. And if you really want to transform the way this stuff works, you need to focus on neural networks. And I was like, look, dude, like, I'm just trying to finish my degree here you know, and move on. And I was, you know, also extra, you know, very excited about you know, this line of work as, as well. But look, this was 2007, 2006, 15, 17 years later, real breakthroughs happened. And Jan came on the right side of his predictions. So to answer your question, what's really pushed things forward? It's been compute. What's interesting is like what made Google possible was it was their innovations around compute. What what made OpenAI possible was really NVIDIA and, and their innovations around compute. So we're here today and it is truly transformative. An example I like to use, imagine if you're a marketer and you had the best data analyst in your entire business sitting to your right and the most experienced marketing op ops person to your left who knows every campaign that's run across every single channel with performance over the last decade. And then every time you click a mouse button or look at any system 
system you have, these two minds are right there to make the entire process as seamless as possible. And these are the kinds of things that this next generation of technology enables. And these are the kinds of things that when you're able to bring you know, the right level of data, the right context, obviously for us, thinking about what, what 100 max data means in this context, yeah, you know, these are the kinds of things that are truly transformative. I think one challenge with your know, products get commoditized when the inputs and outputs are prescriptive and you have more than one player who can you know, compete for a similar result. They're really looking at this next generation of, of, of agentic workflows, you know, AI agents, uh, you're really integrating AI with first party data, with first party systems, and have them do actual work, give you operating leverage, drive insights and business processes in a way that you, know, you, you can't do on your own yeah. and, and drive both a next generation of efficiency and outcomes as well. Can you just explain a little bit about, I think we use this term artificial intelligence broadly to describe a whole bunch of different things. Machine learning is something different, right? LLMs are a component of artificial intelligence, but I think we use AI to just describe this sort of catch-all bucket of everything. How would you define an AI agent? How would you define an LLM? And how do you think that these things are evolving in our industry um, for customers who are activating data using AI agents to to make better use of their data across advertising and own media. Yeah, I think with the you know, the 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 advent of LLMs and you know, I guess the demonstration that they've you know, shown around the potential to drive something which actually feels like intelligence. AI, in many ways, is getting to be synonymous with LLMs at this point. Yeah. But look, you, you look at Singularity, you look at all the, everyone on, on, on X or Twitter, or whatever it's called these days, this is really, when people think AI, it's how do you really augment and eventually replace human intelligence with these systems. ML is, is much more constrained. Machine learning, classical machine learning, my PhD was more focused on classical machine learning. They're much there are problems that are more focused on optimization. There are problems that the outputs are more numeric in nature. So what's the probability that Dylan might convert given that he spent two hours on the site and I spent 90 minutes on the site, but you know, he's spent you know, more money in the past than I have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you're a publisher and if you're trying to optimize media placements, how do you think about ad bids and inventory and supply constraints? Those are all classical machine yeah. learning problems. Yeah, their AI is much more focused on looking at what humans do well an ML is more focused on numeric problems where most humans wouldn't be able to reason about how do you optimize you know, inventory and supply chains for Amazon's business, as an example. Yeah. So now with AI, you're saying as synonymous with LLMs basically for marketing and the fact that these things are rapidly evolving, how far are we from AGI for marketing? I, I think we, I'll answer this in two ways. The short answer is we're pretty close. And my take on the, my, the reason for that is I, I really think there's so much opportunity for marketing teams and uh, to really level up the, the possibility. So the question is, what kind of systems do you need today to replicate the output that the average marketing team is pushing today? I think we're not more than two, three years out from that. Wow. Yeah. But look, at the same time, the question that excites me isn't that, but it's how do you take the, the, the opportunities today and level them up 10x? If a marketing team with a next generation of tools three years from now can increase conversion rates by 3x and can increase customer lifetime value by 60%, then look, like the technology isn't driving efficiency gains. It's driving top-line improvements. And it's really turning the problem from much less of a cost center to one of much a driver in, in revenue and an opportunity in a hyper-competitive market. Yeah. Really... Yeah, I think the, the businesses that will come out on the winning side of this will be those that you know, aren't looking at AI as a cost center first, you know, but instead as one you know, to really just you know, ask, how can we you know, elevate our position uh, in the marketplace? Without getting into specifics of customers or our customers, what are some of the most interesting use cases you're seeing leveraging LLMs today with the AI capabilities for marketing? Yeah, look, when I think about the opportunity in, in our strategy at Simon Data, there, there are two problems that we're focused on at a high level. Yeah, the first is using all available data, historical campaign segments, you know, third-party data around customer reviews and whatnot, first-party data around, around product reviews, and asking how do you put that together in a way to enhance strategies. You're a, a ticketing retailer and you're trying to sell same-day tickets. If, you've, if you live 50 miles away from the stadium, you're probably not going to be able to drive to see the next play 
at 6 p.m. for a 7 p.m. game. But if you live in Hudson Yards and you pay you know, $9,000 a month in rent right. and the Lakers are in town and there's some hot seats, like you, you, you might be able to get someone to go out. Yeah, the first part of, of this problem is a strategy and understanding you know, what needs to happen. And when you look at you know, the, the, the incredible wealth and diversity of cost of behaviors, how do you put the two together in a way to you know, you know, reason about things in, the enti- in its entirety? And the benefits, the value there is you, how do you think broadly across your customer base and how do you, within everyone within your customer base, how do you really target them one-to-one in the most specific way possible? Yeah. And then the second opportunity is around getting back to my previous example before around, you imagine you have your marketing operations person on your left and your data analyst on your right is then making it happen. So you know, I want to identify everyone who lives within a one hour drive or commute from Penn Station to see the Knicks play. You have the data there, but taking a last mile, like you could call up your data science team and three weeks later, they'll come and you know, give you the answer, but the opportunity is gone and you don't have the resources cross-functionally to, to do something like that anyway. Right. So how do you take you know, you know, that you know, next generation of access and you know, you know, all the, the processing capabilities that exist in LMs and in the systems you have today and the systems that you know, can be brought to the table and take something that would otherwise require a degree of expertise, cross-functional dependencies and time and have it take five minutes or, yeah. or, or one minute. Yeah. I, mean, I think obviously we're in this hype cycle for AI, right? And I think everyone is in our industry very optimistic about the potential. But at the same time, like there are many data challenges that underpin the ability to do these things that you're talking about. What percentage of businesses do you think actually have their data in a place where they would be able to power these types of use cases using using LLMs? Look, it's high. And I think you know, the way I look at this is any business that is is looking at potential around AI to unlock what they're doing needs to be pushing forward. Yeah. And like one of our design principles when we think about AI agents and agentic workflows is it's all about working backwards. It's about starting with the strategy first and then asking if I'm trying, if my strategic goals this quarter, getting back to the previous example, or to make sure that tickets don't go unsold day of game, then you know, what do I need to get that in place? Okay. And you know, the answer is I don't need a perfect you know, database with all my customer data in a way that's perfectly clean. I need the right view in my customers to affect this outcome. So I think it really involves working backwards and first party data obviously is critical to this, but there's also third party data, there's second party data, there's so much, there's so much additional context. You browse on the ticketing marketplace on your phone, you browse at home, there's geo context data, you can locate that to where folks are. And there's just a lot of other things uh, and data sources that you know, most brands haven't tapped yet, that with the right points of expertise are and the right agentic workflows can just be unlocked instantaneously. What are you most excited about? And then what do you think is the most overhyped aspect of all this? I always like to you know, give the example, I can go to to chat GPT right now and says and say write me a, a compelling email to sell socks, and it'll do a great job. I wouldn't call it a solved problem, but yeah. it's not too far. It's like from better a than most humans. It's better than most <laughs> humans. Yeah, you know, and I can yeah, you know, and I can take the last ten emails that I've composed to my customers and say put make the brand voice look like this, and it will do as well as anyone I can hire. Yeah. Okay. So that's a solved problem. The question really lies is look if I'm a marathon runner and I need a specific type of sock, or if I like to wear bright colored shoes, or if I always dress in suits, this kind of context will tell me a lot more about what kind of customer needs what kind of socks. Yeah. Uh, and this, for me, is really the big unlock. And yeah, yeah. And imagine that across like your entire portfolio of SKUs, right? If you're just in the business of selling socks, I agree the problem is probably solved. But if you're if you have 10,000 plus SKUs across an entire athleisure portfolio of products, or you're an airline and you're trying to do seat optimization and all that sort of stuff, I think obviously the ways that data gets used are, it's more challenging certainly. And then there's more ambiguity in the middle, right? right? Between like how that data gets structured and utilized by the model for which marketing use cases. Yep, exactly. And to answer your other question around what's most overhyped, yeah, I, I think there's obviously a real AI craze right now. Yeah, and I think it's just critical that when anyone is evaluating AI to really ask the questions like, what value is being added here over top of what I can just go and type into OpenAI yeah, for free? Yeah. 
you know, and I think there were a lot of businesses that scaled very quickly on the back of the premise of um, going to take a topic that is entered by a human, you know, pass that to open AI and get a blog post and then make two calls to WordPress, <laughs> you know, to put it on a website and then charge someone 20 bucks a month a seat. Yeah. Yeah. And that worked great for three months until someone actually went through the process and they're like, wait a second, what am I spending my money on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think there's a lot of this going to come and go. And I think ultimately the market will drive in the directions where value is actually being created. But there's a lot of noise at this moment. How do you see enterprises mitigating hallucination or just generally either using AI as a co-pilot to a human who ultimately makes the decisions or how does the enterprise workflow evolve around AI? Yeah, look, it's all ultimately about control. When in machine learning terms, there's two types of optimization. There's what we call a closed loop optimization where the thing just runs and it makes its own decisions. Yeah, and then there's more the open loop optimization where it runs, it makes some, some suggestions, you can go and audit it, you can edit it, you and you have a bit more visibility. Our focus, both given some of the enterprise concerns that you outline, and also just the strategy of the problems that we're fundamentally solving is more of the open loop style. You know, when we you know, think about you know, the broader opportunity, how do you think strategically about what's really going to get someone's interest? Uh, and yes, you can try out every possibility and see what works best. Yeah, you know, that is one way of doing it. You know, it's a, it's a potentially expensive way of doing it. Yeah, you know, but if you know that you know, Dylan has only purchased on a, you know, with a coupon, or you know, every time LeBron James has been in New York, I've gone to the game. You know, in the last five years, it's like you don't need to necessarily experiment. Right. You know, like the data speaks for itself. But how many brands today are actually asking the data in a smart enough way to understand that?